My screen okay? Yeah, that's be as before, roughly an hour and uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. But since we're starting early, I suppose you can do anything you like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'll try not to abuse the uh, time here too much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, hoping we can have a, a dialogue, actually, if, if that works out during the talk. I uh, don't mind if people jump in with questions, et cetera. So, um, uh, so this is usually the slide that I start uh, with uh, teaching my class on neural networks and cognition. And that's my field. My background is in, in kind of developing neural network models of the brain um, and specifically trying to focus more on the biology, which I'll tell you about a little bit. Uh, but I always start off with this slide, and um, uh, you know the key idea here is to illustrate where I think emergence comes from in a very very simple kind of uh, physical system, and it's just literally uh, in panel A here with the two gears not interacting, you have no emergent properties. But as soon as you kind of create an interaction between these two very simple physical components, something emerges, right? And, and what emerges is a relationship among the speed of rotation of the gears, the amount of torque that would be present at each of the ax axles. Um, and, you know, the uh, composition of the gears doesn't matter at all. So you could make this system out of plastic or metal. Uh, as long as you have a certain amount of basic rigidity, you're going to get the same kind of emergent properties coming out of this system. Um, and so this provides, I think, a nice, you know, super simple way of understanding uh, where emergence comes from. And the conclusion is that it comes from the interactions, right? Uh, that it's not about the physical components themselves. It's all about the relationships uh, between these physical components and how they mutually affect each other. That's what determines kind of this magic uh, uh, property that's not present in the components, but emerges out of them, right? Um, and, and so if you think about emergence in this way, uh, it's, it's, you can kind of quantify the degree of emergence in terms of the type of interactions that you have, right? And so uh, you guys talk, I think, a lot about condensed matter systems and, um, and these kind of physical systems that have these spatially defined interactions. And in some ways, that's, uh, you know, a certain kind of class of interactions that could arise for any like, you know, constituted system, if you have some kind of spatially defined interactions that have a positive and excited, uh, positive or negative character, um, you, the same kinds of things will emerge out of that system. And in, in contrast, in the brain, you can think of the brain as being a kind of physical system that really maximizes the degree of these interactions, right? The potential for these interactions. Um, and, uh, and so it has, you know, roughly 10,000 uh, uh, neurons uh, project to a given cortical neuron. And then that cortical neuron then in fact sends its signal to 10,000 other uh, uh, neurons at least. And so you have a, kind of order of interaction in this sense, uh, significant interaction, each of those 10,000 connections can potentially, you know, play a role in shaping the response of the neuron that, that is perhaps way higher than, any, than most other physical systems, right? So it's, it's maximizing the potential for emergence by virtue of having a large number of interactions per kind of unit um, and, uh, and then each of those interactions is mediated by a synaptic connection. And the synaptic connection is essentially parameterized by, you know, a learned uh, value. This is actually where learning occurs in the brain. And so, you know, if you think about that, it's not a fixed 
form of interaction, but rather a dynamic changing form of interaction, changeable form of interaction. And so if you think about all those pieces, you kind of get a sense of like, okay, here's your standard physical system. You know, again, like a spin glass or something that would have kind of a low order, uh, uniform field of interactions with its neighbors. And then you look at the brain and you have the system that has like incredibly high dimensional, dynamically adjustable forms of interactions among, you know, a very diverse set of neurons defined over this kind of network of connectivity. And you say, okay, this is a system that has a incredibly high level of capacity for emergence defined in terms of these interactions. So that's how I think about uh, this concept of emergence in the context of the brain in relation to other kind of physical systems. So I'm curious, uh, basically, how does that resonate with with you guys, and what 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 kind of uh, you know, uh, how does, how does that connect? Anybody want to jump in and yeah, well, let, me let, me, let, let me, let me ask a question. Um, <laughs> yeah. when you say that an, a, a neuron interacts with 10,000 other neurons, uh, one's very tempted to think of one over 10,000 as a very small number and therefore don't, why don't things just sort of self average, uh, clean, right. clean, you'd think it would be a very bland mean field like system, uh, which it clearly isn't, uh, um, and so what's different about interacting with 10,000 other neurons that doesn't just self-average? Right, that's a great point because um, in fact, uh, when we've been scaling up our models, we've encountered um, this exact problem, which is sort of the law of large numbers. Uh, everything converges towards a, a very small variance uh, kind of uniform value. Um, and interestingly, Potentially, it, it is the, the kind of noise uh, characteristic of the brain that uh, is really relevant there. And the fact that each neuron is, in fact, sending information through spikes, and those spikes, uh, as far as we can tell, generally have a Poisson distribution, which is, in some sense, the highest variance form of distribution, um, that keeps the system kind of from becoming a very boring mean field type of system and uh, creates sort of the opportunity for uh, high, retaining a high level of variance in the, in the signals that are going around despite the high order of the interaction. But I do think there actually is a, a real tension there that um, you know the, the reason the brain doesn't have 100,000 uh, neurons connecting to each neuron, uh, 100,000 synapses is, is probably for that exact reason that if you go too big, you do end up kind of averaging too much and you don't get enough kind of emergent uh, dynamics out of it. Yes, there, there are uh, spin frustrated spin glass systems, which despite having uh, all to all interactions can show very rich emergent behavior. I see, okay. Right? I mean, good. you know, it's more unfrustrated systems where you end up in a mean field, simple mm -hmm. mean field. Mm -hmm. So frustration is also important, yes. What is what is the technical meaning of frustration? Sorry, if that's easy Competition, to describe. Competition, really, that they are competing. They, all the all the interactions aren't trying to do the same thing. They are competing. Uh -huh. You can't find a solution which mutually satisfies all the interactions. Right. Um. Cool. Okay. So, any other? thoughts in relation to this kind of nature of the origin of emergence is consistent with, with the kind of ideas is there a, is there a term that you guys use for this kind of uh it comes out of the interaction basically the the, the nature of the relationships that that yeah we often use the term strongly rules. correlated uh, uh, -huh. uh which is which comes from and strongly interacting in an interchangeable way so it, it resonates very well with the quantum community at least yeah cool okay so uh i'll just keep going here and um yeah so if you look at you know the actual biology of what's going on uh in these interactions among the neurons um this is a classic drawing of two different populations of neurons in the neocortex. Um, 
the excitatory neurons are known as the pyramidal cells. Um, and they're the ones that have these kind of long range, 10, order 10,000 uh, synaptic connections um, and have this kind of whole network of connectivity that's been characterized as kind of this classic small world uh, pattern of connectivity with a lot of sort of nearby connections, but also a significant number of uh, long range connections and that um, small world connectivity basically means that, you know, the, the minimum path length between any two neurons is kind of, you know, surprisingly small, uh, you know, the, the six degrees of separation kind of idea, et cetera. Um, and so even though uh, you, each neuron has this sort of very small number of connections, it's like, you know, 10 billion neurons, 20 billion neurons in the, in the brain, um, even with that 10,000 uh, connections, due to the nature of the network, you still have a, a sort of small, small world connectivity. Um, and that's the primary source of information processing is through these uh, excitatory neurons. And then the inhibitory neurons are all very local and very distinct. And if you think about like the complexity that's present in the, in the structure of the, the cortex, it's all in these inhibitory neurons. The, the excitatory neurons are much more uniform and, and sort of similar to each other, but there's a great diversity of these inhibitory neurons. And they do play this role of, I guess, frustration generation in the context of, of that terminology, uh, creating an inhibitory competition among uh, the excitatory neurons for the ability to you know, be active and send their signals out. And so you, you definitely have this notion of a sort of competitive network where all the excitatory neurons are essentially inhibiting each other indirectly through these inhibitory neurons and only the excitatory neurons that um, you know, are above some critical level of excitation are able to consistently send their signals out to other neurons and the rest are suppressed. And so the typical degree of sparsity in firing in the, in the neocortex is on, on the order of about 10%, 10 to 15% of the neurons um, are kind of engaged at any given point in time. Uh, so it is a sparse, coding kind of situation in, in the cortex as a result of all these inhibitory kind of regulatory neurons going on. Um, and so there are a lot of interesting emergent dynamics that take place uh, in these networks because of that interplay between excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurons. And that's a big theme that's, that a lot of people have explored in, in the field of neuroscience. Um, and it, it is different for example, than what's captured in the standard Hopfield network, uh, which doesn't sort of obey this uh, uh, clear dichotomy between excitatory only. So these, these pyramidal cells only communicate through excitatory uh, neurotransmitters. Um, and it really is a, a separate uh, class of neurons that do the inhibitory or negative synaptic weights uh, effectively. Whereas in a, in a hot field network, they're kind of inner, inner, uh, each neuron kind of plays both roles. And so you may get some different dynamics as a result of that as well. Okay, so uh, the other kind of key features uh, of, the, of the brain, broadly speaking, um, uh, have to do with this kind of hierarchical organization of the connections. So this is a kind of classic diagram uh, that's been updated in this paper in 2014, but originally was due to this uh, scientist named David Van Essen, who created these incredibly complicated uh, uh, data-driven um, uh, patterns of connectivity, showing that you know information flows in a sort of hierarchical fashion in the visual system. <coughs> excuse me, uh, going from the primary visual inputs in V1 up into these two different pathways. Um, one pathway that is focused on kind of recognizing objects down here, this is the, through the ventral or uh, temporal lobe pathway. Um, and then uh, this is the dorsal uh, or parietal lobe pathway that goes and, and ends up processing uh, motion information and also uh, being uh, very important for all forms of motor control. And so there's this really interesting kind of property of uh, kind of specialization in the brain, but also as you can see massive 
kind of interconnectivity regardless, along with this kind of classic hierarchical organization that allows these pathways to sort of do individual steps of information processing that build on each other and create sort of high level representations at the highest levels of this hierarchy that reflect all of the individual sort of transformations of the signal uh, along the way. And so, you know, the current uh, uh, AI models, uh, deep neural networks uh, capture this aspect of the brain that there is this kind of sense of hierarchy in processing. Um, so those are some of the broad features, you know, that, that are generally well accepted about how the how the networks of the brain are organized. And these certainly inform the, the work that I'm doing in my uh, computational models of the brain. Okay, any questions about any of the... Basic... Yeah, what, what, what is visual three and visual four, if that's what they are? Yes. Uh, so each of these uh, sort of has a, a well-recognized function. Uh, so some, you know, to some degree, um, v4 here is is associated with uh uh where you first get you know really clear distinctions between different color representation you know different uh patterns of color in the visual image um and uh more complex encoding of uh, aspects of shapes um whereas in v2 and v1 the representations are much more at the level of kind of very simple line elements. So pulling out essentially the edges of the image. And, um, and then when you get into TEO and TE, et cetera, this, this, these are areas where you actually see uh, neurons that respond to like entire complex objects. Um, and they're not really one-to-one -one with an object. So there's this whole issue of Sort of distributed representations versus localist representations. Uh, the the neurons typically have very complex patterns of tuning in in kind of object space. So you know they they don't really map one to one onto something kind of intuitively sensible. Uh, but more or less, they're decoding different kinds of object categories up there. Um, and it's actually really important to look at the distributed pattern of similarity across entire sets of neurons as opposed to trying to figure out what each individual neuron is doing that gives you a much clearer signal of what what kind of information is being represented yeah so you can kind of see pretty clearly a progression as you go up the hierarchy of increasing complexity of object level information that's being extracted as you go up that way V3 is a particularly interesting area that few people talk about um, in the standard kind of like textbook level treatment. Um, and it's directly interconnected with this other area, 8L. 8L is actually your primary uh, uh, representations of where are you gonna move your eyes it's called the frontal eye field. And so there's a very interesting story about the connection between sort of motor control and vision that is very intimately connected. So in, the, in this connectivity hierarchy, the idea that this kind of frontal area uh, where you can have motor control is, is really at this very low level of the visual hierarchy functionally um, is one of the most interesting aspects of this whole diagram. Uh, and so V3 is essentially telling uh, your uh, motor system sort of where to look uh, at a very low level. Um, and this other area here, LIP, sort of involve, uh, controls higher level uh, signals about where to look when you know, you're sort of scanning around on the visual scene. Yeah, so that's some, some of the, the stories. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Wow. If, I com if I compare that, the analogy that you did with the, uh, the idea of interactions, I think the, the, the difference here with condensed matter cases is that you have a, a big uh, uh, organized hierarchy of interactions, which yes. means all, all you have a fun functional differences between the neurons and the way they are connected, which we do not have usually in the systems we are studying, which are flat in some sense. That in, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's not a homogeneous 
substrate of any sort, right? It's very much uh, a, a structured network. Yeah, it's not even disorder. It's uh, it's uh, ordered. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. There, there is an order in the interactions. Yes, absolutely. And yep. That makes the functionalities are much much higher. Indeed. And, yep. Okay. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, um, yeah. So hold that thought because that's kind of what I'm going to come back to. Um, the other really important uh, property of this network is this very uh, strong uh, propensity for symmetric connectivity. Um, and so here we just have all of those areas plus, you know, more. Um, and uh, you have, you know, a kind of square matrix of each area on each axis. Uh, and what you see then, if you kind of look at the kind of diagonal uh, uh, you know, reflection here, fold the paper over on the diagonal, so to speak, um, is really that every area that receives a strong connection uh, as the source over here on the vertical axis also kind of sends a connection back to that other area. Uh, 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 well, I guess source, and this is the receiver here. So um, yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. So basically, if, if, if we go back to this diagram, you know, if V4 sends a connection to TEO, TEO also uh, sends a connection back down to V4, right? And likewise, for all of these different areas, including kind of bi-directionally. So TEO sends to MT and MT also sends back to TEO. And, um, and of course the connectivity uh, you know, probably it's the case that you could find some small number of synapses between all of these areas. And so there's a threshold that's been applied here. Um, so these are the, the kind of major connections. Um, and so, uh, but you can really see that for the major pathways of connectivity, um, by and large, it's symmetric. And in fact, one of the things that's most interesting about this is finding the ones that aren't symmetric and wondering about what's going on with those um, because the, the default story, the main story is this incredible amount of symmetry. What, what so, for example, LIP to TF is one yes. way. What does that yep. mean? Yep, so LIP to, to TF. TF. Right there, a little outlier. Yeah. This little Doesn't block. seem to have a counterpart the other way around. And that is fascinating because LIP, okay, is really the primary uh, region where you're focusing kind of your spatial attention. So if you're thinking about where something is in the, in the spatial world around you, um, that's encoded in LIP. And TF is very high up in your kind of uh, uh, object recognition pathway. And it, this is where your information about objects has now subtracted away all uh, kind of spatial information. Um, and so there isn't any really useful signal here to tell uh, the, the spatial pathway something interesting, but somehow interestingly enough, the spatial pathway can still go the other way. So mm -hmm. some of these things actually do make sense, um, the exceptions, and, uh, and you can actually kind of reason through some of them. There's some of these guys over here that are also, I think in general, LIP is one of the areas that participates in a lot of asymmetric connectivity. And that is interesting because it is a real hub area. So that's another thing. You can look at some of these areas and some of them have higher order, uh, more degrees of connectivity than others. And, uh, and that reflects this kind of status as a hub versus not. I'm not sure this is really super clearly reflected in all those lines in this figure, but uh, in this respect, LIP, I think definitely has more asymmetric connectivity. Uh, anyway, um, the bidirectional connectivity is very important from uh, many uh, different aspects. And that's kind of one of the things I'm gonna focus on here. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the most basic things that happens as a result of the bi-directional connectivity 
is a kind of uh, ability to settle into a stable attractor state. And this is really the idea that's captured in the uh, Hopfield network. Um, and as long as you have some degree of symmetry uh, in the patterns of connectivity in the network, you know, mathematically, that's this is kind of what Hopfield showed. You you can you know create this Lyapunov function and and show that the iterative updating of the system over time converges on a stable attractor state, right? Um, and if all of the connections are perfectly symmetric, this happens, you know, uh, with mathematical uh, precision, right? It always happens. It isn't the case in the brain, obviously that you ever have something like perfect symmetry. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, given this broad patterns of connectivity and also just empirically looking at, you know, networks that deviate in their patterns of uh, um, symmetry, it's still, you don't have to be perfect to get a, a strong propen propensity to settle into stable attractor states, right? Um, and so this is a very important uh, concept that is actually talked about a lot in uh, kind of the cognitive understanding of how the brain works. Uh, so this is the, you know, the classic spin glass icing kind of uh, uh, network uh, uh, understanding from Hopfield. Um, and, you know, the, the key idea here is that these kind of local updates uh, that are taking place at each individual neuron has this kind of emergent global effect on the overall energy of the system. And so by each neuron kind of doing its own local computation, it, it allows the entire global state to perform this very useful kind of overall computational function. And the way I think about this and the way it was talked about in the original kind of neural network literature is in terms of this idea of multiple constraint satisfaction. And so each Neuron, if you go back to this kind of diagram here, each neuron in each of these different brain areas is reflecting some constraint, some learned piece of information about how things generally tend to go together. And then you've got a lot of constraints coming in from the visual world and your job in sort of perceiving a visual scene, for example, is trying to put together all of those kind of pieces of current information coming in from the visual world, plus all of the learned constraints, so to speak, about how you think the world generally should work in, in some sense through all this uh, network connectivity. And then you're essentially trying to find the interpretation of that visual scene that best fits all of those constraints through this kind of settling process. And so that's why this kind of, you know, Hopfield model is a very nice framework for understanding kind of cognition, you're trying to make sense of things in a, in a very, uh, um, you know, in, in a way that obeys these constraints and you don't need to get to the, you know, global minimum uh, actually converging on the, the ultimate global minimum, but sort of, you know, local minima usually are pretty reasonable. So these, these, those kinds of ideas are, are often talked about in the context of, you know, uh, figures like this, if any, has anybody not seen this before? What is it? I haven't seen it. No, I haven't. Seen oh, great. It. It's always good. I, I, with my psychology classes, unfortunately, everybody's already seen these things. So uh, it's only interesting if you haven't seen it before because there's actually something in this picture. And when you first see it, you don't see that thing. And then it's like, aha, it kind of emerges. Um, Unfortunately, once you have seen it, it just like you see it immediately. And so it loses all of its uh, interest in that respect. Uh, so if you keep staring at it, eventually these weak bottom up constraints, you know, which just look like a bunch of blobs will sort of converge uh, through the internal constraints that you have in your brain uh, and, and you'll settle into an attractor state that, you know, actually makes sense of these kind of ambiguous bottom-up views in the context of, you know, everything you've learned about the world. 
sometimes you need some hints to get sort of settling into the attractor state. Some people hate it when, when you get hints. <laughs> uh, anybody want a hint? Yeah, I'd like a hint. Okay. Focus on this part of the image here and think of a Doberman. Doberman is the right dog. That's the one with spots, right? Um, yes. And in particular, this is the leg and head of a Doberman, you know, uh, kind of with its head down on the ground. And now you can kind of see the body. This is a tail up here, back leg. Now it starts to pop into view. Yes. So Dalmatian is the right type of dog. My wife just texted me because she could hear me keep this up. Um, yes. Uh, there's a tree in the background. There's some kind of uh, texture here. So eventually it sort of converges. There's also these really annoying 3D uh, random dot stereograms that you can torture yourself with that, that also give this characteristic of where you can actually feel your brain sort of settling into an attractor state uh, as you start to converge on, on interpreting those cues. Um, everybody see it? Yeah, now we're given an yeah. interpretation. <laughs> yes, I see it. But you could, yes. you, there are other alternative interpretations you could make, right? Yeah. Presumably, yeah. yeah. This one, uh, yeah. So speaking of that, another very popular demonstration of this point is this kind of Necker cube. Um, and if you stare at uh, this one over here, this is the ambiguous case. Um, and if you stare at it long enough, you, you clearly see one of these two interpretations at a time. Um, and then if you stare at it long enough and force yourself to keep looking at it, you'll find that your, your brain kind of switches to the other interpretation automatically um, uh, with some periodicity. Uh, and, and it kind of goes back and forth between those two attractor states. And so this is, you know, perfectly ambiguous between these two interpretations. And interestingly, you know, each sort of vertex provides a certain amount of constraint. And there's two essentially stable global solutions to that, uh, to those constraints, um, mutually consistent uh, interpretations. And then when the neurons that have, are encoded of those interpretations get tired, uh, literally, they, they have this kind of fatigue-like process that goes on. Um, then the other interpretation, which has been sort of competing through those inhibitory uh, connections I was telling you about, um, then that uh, alternative interpretation pops into the foreground, right? And so you can kind of subjectively experience this tractor dynamics sort of by, by staring at these uh, ambiguous figures. And that's true with a lot of other ambiguous figures as well. So hopefully have, people have a nice phenomenology of of attractor dynamics taking place in your brain. Okay, so um, <laughs> so another source of, of ambiguity comes from uh, occluded, partially occluded images. Anybody have any ideas what what these are? This like a walking person. Walking person. Yep, this one. Pretty tricky. I think that one might be a motorcycle. Wheel, wheel, engine. Yeah. Yep. This one, the plumber's wrench. <laughs> and over here, any guesses? Cell phone. Uh, <laughs> looks like a cell phone, but this little, this little padded what gives it away this is a uh, an old-fashioned turntable which i guess is coming back into fo uh, fashion these days the I see. lp player um so so you have again this phenomenology of this kind of constraint satisfaction process iterative you know taking of these different aspects of the visual scene you have to actually cod around and look at different aspects of the scene 
And then that, that pathway that's trying to make sense of the kind of object pathway, the ventral visual pathway is trying to put together all these constraints and, and come up with an interpretation that fits with all those cues. Um, and so we made a model of this that uh, was uh, published, you know, just uh, in the very early days of these kind of deep neural network models and remains to this day, one of the few uh, models that actually has this kind of uh, top down bottom up uh, dynamic that is operating in the context of this kind of object recognition process. So this is a very simple model that takes a visual input um, uh, goes from this V1 to V2. IT is another name for those TEO type of pathways um, uh, that we looked at, TETEO uh, in the ventral visual stream. Uh, so it stands for infratemporal cortex. Uh, and then you have some kind of naming output of the object that you're seeing. And in this model, we found uh, over time when you gave it those kinds of uh, ambiguous images, and you iterate over cycles of settling. So each step in each individual neuron in the entire network, each of these little tiny squares here is a, is a simulated neuron. Um, they are each updating their local information very much as in the Hopfield network. Uh, and we actually use a sort of more biological version of that uh, uh, dynamic, but it's, it's really the, conceptually the same thing. And what you see is that the lower levels kind of converge early on here, V4 starts to, to get some interpretation of what's going on in terms of the, the sort of lower level visual features. And then slowly the higher levels like IT in the network start to catch on to what's going on and are starting converging on some pattern that will ultimately be the final interpretation. This is a plot of how close um, the representation is in this area to the representation you would get of this object if it was not occluded. Um, so it's sort of how close is the representation across the entire layer to the, the sort of correct final interpretation. So one means that the cosine, the pattern, the, the similarity, uh, the vectors, so to speak, align 100%. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that there's an initial sort of intermediate stage where you're kind of getting at what you're seeing, but it's not quite there. And then that interacts with the semantic area. So this is now uh, sort of getting some sense of what it is that, that you're seeing. And then those two sort of talk to each other, so to speak, top down, bottom up. And ultimately then uh, the name area also starts to get active. And all three of these guys sort of interact with each other at this critical moment um, and sort of bootstrap into that attractor state up here where you finally end up being in the sort of correct uh, interpretation of what you're seeing. So you can really see these constra whoops, constraint satisfaction dynamics sort of playing out in the context of the hierarchy uh, over time, very much you know, uh, along the same principles of these kind of attractor dynamics but also overlaid on top of this kind of hierarchical connectivity where you know, these higher level signals are, are much lower dimensional. And so there's not, there's not an infinite you know, space of sort of objects that you might be seeing. And so once you start to converge on, oh, I think that sort of looks like a fish or whatever it is in the, in the particular case, that provides you know, particularly strong attractor states for resolving sort of where the different features go. And so the, the fact that you actually have these higher level, more abstract object-like representations really constrains the system to converge on these, you know, object-like attractors. So just like we saw with the dog and with these examples here. So there really are a lot of interesting kind of, uh, you know, applications of these kind of dynamic attractor uh, 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 principles in understanding how, the, how these systems operate. And they kind of interact in interesting ways with the network connectivity and the, the abstraction uh, and the hierarchy that's, that's in the structure of the networks. And uh, I'll point out that, you know, all of those interesting dynamics are actually missing from uh, most of the current sort of deep neural network models, the AI models that are being used these days. 
because essentially they're they're computationally expensive. Um, so it takes you know the cycles of settling every time for the network to process the information that it's seeing. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of extra connectivity. Uh, and the dynamics are can be chaotic. They can introduce uh, you know a lot of complexity in the response of the network, and all of that you know has benefits, but it also has a lot of costs. And so in the in the current uh, models that are in use, they just get rid of all those backward connections, and everything is strictly feed forward. So you go from the image up to an interpretation, and that's it. Um, and, and that actually, I think, is responsible for a lot of the brittleness of these models. So if they happen to, in the one feed forward pass, hit the right interpretation, great. But if they don't, then there's no opportunity for this kind of iterative attractor dynamic to sort of clean up or fix the representation. Um, and so most of the models that we know from, from these AI techniques sort of solve this in, instead of making the, the network quote unquote smarter by having these attractor states, they solve it by essentially introducing, you know, massive, you know, increasing the size of the, of the space of uh, training um, uh, images and just sort of, you know, uh, brute forcing it, so to speak, so that you have every possible, you know, version of this fish image with all these different forms of occlusion. And you essentially try to just really learn the feed forward mapping instead of sort of solving the problem through these kind of attractor dynamics. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how this relates, these biological principles relate to kind of what's going on in the AI field. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, I think, oh, I have one more interesting thing to say about bi-directional uh, connectivity. Um, which is this uh, very interesting work from uh, this scientist named Victor Lamey. He's a neuroscientist who studies, you know, uh, empirically what seems to be correlated in the brain with states of consciousness defined here as conscious awareness. Um, and his conclusion is that we experience this sort of subjective sense of conscious awareness to the extent that there is this kind of widespread recurrent processing throughout the brain. And here you can see an, a little illustration of this kind of hierarchical network that we've been looking at, V1, V2, V4, TE. So that's exactly this network I was just showing you. Um, and when you have enough time and enough uh, coherence between the low level kind of visual features and the higher level parts of the network as illustrated in these kind of bi-directional lines here. Um, also having broader coherence sort of not only within the visual system but also up here in the frontal, uh, prefrontal cortex. This is kind of your higher level uh, cognition area where you're thinking about kind of tasks and things you wanna do. Um, that when you get all of those different areas, essentially all in a, a single uh, emergent bi-directional attractor state, that's when you have consciousness. That's when you have a, a reliable conscious percept. And that you can experimentally manipulate things like time and degree of um, you know, coherence of the visual input and all these different factors and, and actually record in the brain, especially in the brains of monkeys, um, when you have, you know, these different degrees of coherence among the, among the neural firing. And, and it really does seem to be the case that, you know, taking all this together, uh, consciousness somehow emerges out of uh, this bi-directional constraint satisfaction process operating in the brain. Um, so that's pretty, pretty wild. Uh, and I think uh, if you look across all the different, you know, more abstract theories of consciousness, almost all of them, you know, that have some reference to kind of how the brain works, have this same characteristic that it's something about this kind of interaction among all of these different elements, uh, especially in a bi-directional way. Uh, people talk about a global workspace uh, where, where all these different things are kind of communicating, sharing little bits of information with each other that that kind of 
process of mutual informing and constraining um, really is sort of at the essence of what makes a conscious uh, state in the brain. And so uh, one could argue then that this bidirectional connectivity, which gives rise to this kind of ability to, to, to make these different parts of the brain cohere, really is the kind of essence of, of consciousness. And it is an emergent property, uh, you know, kind of par excellence there. Um, and, you know, the, the properties of this network map well to this kind of features that people have identified of consciousness. So it's unitary, uh, this characteristic that we tend to think that, you know, our, our individual conscious states sort of are about something in particular. They're not about everything. They have something that, that kind of characterizes what we are that we're thinking about. Um, and that, that unitariness of the consciousness, the coherence of the consciousness really is about this kind of ability of an attractor state to sort of uh, organize and, and focus all of the different parts of the brain on kind of one particular topic that every part of the brain is essentially you know, uh, reflecting its perspective on. Um, and, and that really is actually functional that, that that ability to sort of marshal all the different parts of our brain on a particular topic of interest is really important for kind of getting all the, the knowledge, the wisdom, so to speak, of all of those different parts of the brain sort of applied to whatever particular problem we're working on. And when you think about, you know, what's going on in this case, it really makes sense, right? So you have all this knowledge about what different parts of the visual world might look like and what different scenes might look like. And so by, by being able to sort of get each of your different levels of your visual system in this case to, to focus on that, they all work together and sort of help solve the problem kind of in, in cooperation. Um, so this, this kind of, idea that this bi-directional you know, connectivity and attractor dynamics is actually very functionally relevant. It's not just an artifact. And that, that also is kind of, you know, the essence of consciousness, I think is a very compelling uh, overall story. So, uh, so that's, that's basically part one of, of my talk is basically this, this key idea that, that, you know, emergence is, a function of the degree of interaction among things. It's basically, uh, you know, almost by definition, emergence depends on having uh, a interaction between elements and it is the interaction that essentially that defines the, the emergence. And that's why you can kind of be independent of the substrate because it's about those interactions. And we can capture those interactions on a computer uh, because, uh, you know, they don't depend on the particular form of the substrate. Um, and that in particular, the bi-directional interactions are special. Uh, and that, you know, this really, this original insight from Hotfield uh, has a lot of relevance, I think, for understanding how the brain works. And in particular, this coordination of top-down higher levels uh, with lower levels and maybe even consciousness. Okay, so we can, we can pause here for any further discussion. And then the next part of my talk is sort of a little bit more detailed discussion of learning. And we may or may not want to dive into that depending on how much uh, discussion we might want to have on these issues. Questions then? Jim, Jim has the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a book by a French researcher named Stanislas de N. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yep. Called Consciousness in the Brain. It's relatively yep. recent. And he spends yep. a, a chapter uh, trying to persuade the reader that by looking at fMRI and EEG and MEG, that he can detect, uh, he and his lab can detect the instant when the brain becomes aware of a yep. conscious, yep. one conscious thought. And yep. And he has a description a lot like what you describe. He yes, talks about exactly. the entire brain yep. kind of yep. lighting up like a phase transition. Does, does yep. that you know, fit in with what you're describing and would it be accepted now or would this be controversial or give me some, some perspective on this? Yeah, absolutely. No, he's, he's among the, the, I think the number of 
theorists and and you know thinkers in this area that that you know converge really on the same idea. So Lamey, you know, talks about it, you know, in terms of a, a series of experiments that he's done. Dehan, exactly the same, uh, I think, you know, uh, conclusion using these uh, fMRI and EEG kinds of experiments. But I think they're in, in complete agreement. They may not think they're in complete agreement, but, um, and, you know, it's always these case where people may, may have small, you know, points of disagreement that get magnified when you're trying to, to, to you know, make some particular claim in an area. But from my perspective, I tend to be a lumper anyway, but, you know, it all seems like the same general story. Uh, I think Dehan talks in particular, perhaps about a global workspace concept. And that I think is really the same idea of sort of spreading uh, and coordinating information throughout the brain. And he may focus more specifically on this one area, the prefrontal cortex, as being particularly important as that kind of global workspace uh, kind of locus, but it's really, I think, the same idea. Can and I, I think it's pursue this? Accepted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I pursue this for just one more minute? Uh, uh, sure. There is uh, one of the meditation practices um, which leads to a state in which one is aware, but but there are no thoughts just awareness but no thoughts and people who study the EEG patterns of this find that a characteristic of it is that certain brain waves are particularly present and not only that but that they are coordinated they are in sync across the whole brain yes. and so yes. that sounds that sounds very organized and one could imagine that it might be competitive with the kind of coherent processes associated with detecting a thought and that and that the, the order that you've created in the meditation practice in some sense suppresses uh, suppresses thoughts is is that a crazy a crazy kind of connection to make yeah no I think that makes a lot of sense so one of the things that's also going on you know in all these circuits is it is a, a kind of um, degree of synchrony of of firing right and so the, all the neurons are, are you know again in this kind of small world interconnected pattern sort of more or less kind of talking with each other and so there is you can kind of characterize the degree of coherence in the in the time space you know the, the extent to, to which they all essentially oscillate together and interestingly you know in subconscious states uh, dream states in particular not necessarily dream states sorry but sleep states non non-dream sleep states I should say, um, are characterized by a much greater synchrony and coherence of these oscillations across the brain. And so it's literally like slow wave sleep is like this very kind of coordinated slow wave oscillation pattern across the brain. And so there is this idea that, you know, there's kind of a continuum of coordination. And if you have too much coordination, okay, characterized by these sort of slow wave sleep states, um, you're actually not conscious, okay? Because essentially everything is sort of doing this one thing and it's not, there's no kind of information there. And so the idea that it's essentially the meditative state is essentially somehow getting closer to that essentially slow wave sleep state, you know? So you basically have a lot of coordination and coherence but then you're sort of losing the information, so to speak. And, you know, we know that information is essentially entropy. Um, and so there, there is this kind of uh, fine line, essentially, between, you know, uh, disorder, uh, which is chaos, which is, you know, uh, entropy, which is information, versus order, which is the coordination of all these different areas. And in particular, you may have heard of this guy, Giulio Tononi, uh, and also Christoph Koch. Uh, they have a particular kind of formulation of consciousness that tries to capture that kind of point of trade-off between um, kind of, you know, entropy information disorder and kind of order coordination and, and kind of this notion of, of coherence um, and saying, you know, the, the, the consciousness is associated maximally with like the perfect trade-off between those two uh, different poles. 
Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense as well in terms of what we're talking about here that, that you know, you want this bi-directional connect connectivity in a tractor state, but you don't want to have just like one state if you're actually doing thinking, you, you know, thought basically is the fact that you have different differentiable states, you know, taking place over time throughout this network. So uh, I think that all makes sense. And that the idea that you can volitionally or somehow through this meditative practice kind of get yourself into that kind of om state of like nothingness, but coordination, but still be sort of conscious, that seems quite, uh, quite magical. But I think it does make sense, you know, kind of fits the phenomenology, so to speak. Thank you very much for yeah. your yeah. comments and reactions yeah. and uh, maybe yeah. for not yeah. laughing at my last question. Oh, no, I think it, I think it's, it's, I think it all makes sense to me. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Gone off in the weeds here. <laughs> well, of course, it, the consciousness, as you described it, is the reaction of a machine. And it's all very well until you confront it with the fact that you yourself are experiencing it. Yes. Uh, and that then poses a paradox, which we perhaps shouldn't get into here. Um, but just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I mean, I think that's the other aspect. So there's the, the sort of and this is this has been identified, you know, in terms of the the quote unquote easy problems of consciousness versus the hard problem of consciousness, mm -hmm. and and that's this uh, Chalmers kind of take on things. And so these are all about the quote unquote easy problems. In other words, kind of what are the correlations between brain states and kind of when we're consciously aware of something versus not. That's something that's amenable to sort of scientific investigation the kind of qualia question of why does it feel like it does for me to be conscious you know is sort of that that property of being this actual physical system and that's sort of beyond the 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 scope of scientific inquiry because it's you know only you can experience your own brain right mm -hmm. um and so it's sort of intrinsically subjective and and sort of inexorably su subjective and that's my take on it so that there's you know, that, that that's the other aspect of consciousness that, you know, we can't really study scientifically because it's intrinsically subjective. But if you set that aside, you can do a lot of work kind of on the neuroscience side of things mm -hmm. to try to understand kind of like what are the correlations between states, you know, brain states and kind of awareness states. And that's this sort of, I think, safer domain of, of scientific inquiry. Yep. Okay, well, uh, we are at the I one just, hour mark now, but yes. uh, if we started early, um, no, no harm in going on 10 more minutes, I think. Yeah, I can just give you a very quick, uh, just sort of FYI type of uh, thing in case anybody's interested. Um, this is kind of the, the, the main aspect of the work that I'm, you know, actually focused on in my research. Um, which is essentially this other aspect of emergence, which is, you know, what happens uh, to cause the emergence of all the kind of internal knowledge that, you know, develops in the brain and how, how does that, what are the processes basically that, that drive this, you know, uh, amazing kind of emergent process of learning. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, this happens in the neocortex uh, one of the things about the neocortex is it starts out incredibly, you know, homogenous and undifferentiated. Um, it's not a perfectly kind of undifferentiated uh, tabula rasa kind of uh, system. There's a lot of pre-wiring that comes in biologically, but, you know, as far as we know, no quote unquote knowledge uh, is pre-wired into the neocortex. And so most of what we ultimately end up you know, knowing as intelligent human beings emerges through this process of learning. And so if you think about learning as kind of the ultimate uh, emergent process, um, then uh, that's, that's kind of been the focus of my research is trying to understand how this works. And interestingly, with respect to the cortex in particular, there really isn't 
uh, in the field uh, a widespread ag uh, agreement about how this actually works. Um, most other parts of the brain experience some kind of learning and we kind of agree scientifically much more about how different parts of the brain work, but there isn't this kind of standard model essentially of how the cortex learns. Um, and uh, not, not for lack of trying. So it's just a, it's one of the great puzzles of neuroscience. Um, and it's interesting because the, the biology of how it works is, is remarkably well understood. Um, so there's all these kind of uh, uh, chemical processes taking place in the synapses driven by particular kinds of receptors. And we know exactly how like each of these different components uh, interacts and it's all driven by calcium uh, and there's magnesium and sodium and all this other, you know, all these elements have been actually really well characterized. So at the, at the kind of low level biology uh, level, it, there's a very clear story. And that story essentially is uh, summarized computationally as sort of Hebbian learning, which is basically this idea that you know, when the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron are both active together, that increases the strength of the connection among the neurons. So the neurons that fire together, wire together is a kind of slogan for heavy and learning. Um, the problem is that when you take this particular set of mechanisms and sort of implement this heavy and learning in a, in a computational model, it doesn't really do what you want it to do. Um, and uh, that's, that's really the problem uh, is that the, the low level bottom up solution doesn't really work at a kind of high level, you know, emergent kind of overall network level of behavior. And I just wanted to point out that um, if you actually uh, take a, a detailed model of this process, um, you can see a uh, version of this original proposal from 1982 called the BCM model. And now we have some superconducting folks here. So uh, <laughs> it's Cooper is the same Cooper from the BCS kind of like, model. like to be second author. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a catalyst, I guess, right? Um, so this, this, this model, you know, really has actually a lot of currency uh to this day and was really prescient you know back in 1982 very little was known about any of this stuff and yet as far as we can tell that's this is the right model for understanding kind of what this biology does um so that's pretty cool um but even this doesn't work kind of computationally uh as well as we might hope right um and what does work is this kind of, you know, uh, what's being exploited in, in all these big AI models. And this is kind of um, uh, error back propagation. And so the idea here is, you know, you, you have this kind of bottom up flow of information. Again, we keep looking at these kind of pathways through the visual stream. And then you have this kind of magic, uh, you know, unexplained uh, source of knowledge that tells the system, oh, that's a cat. And then just using this, the really the basic uh, chain rule, you know, derivative uh, computation from calculus, you can figure out how to change the synaptic connections all the way down in the early layers of this network to minimize the error between kind of what the network said and what this kind of magic answer is. And that's the error back propagation procedure it's literally a kind of gradient descent process. Um, and the important thing about it is that it gets all of the different neurons in each of these different pathways kind of doing the right thing to solve the overall problem. And that's the problem with these models is there is no kind of global objective that these kind of learning mechanisms are solving, they're too local, you know? And so this is kind of, when you think about these emergent dynamics, you look at the Hopfield kind of local update, it solves a global energy kind of Lyapunov function. Um, the same is not true in the context of this learning rule and some kind of global learning objective. 
right? So there's no, if you will, kind of Lyapunov learning function that is being optimized by this particular learning procedure. And that's why it doesn't work. And you really need that kind of local change adding up to doing something at a global level that makes sense. And so back propagation really is just like the, the simplest idea about, you know, you want a network to perform this function, here's how you do it. You minimize the error between what it's doing and what it should be doing and it works. And it really is like the simplest idea, uh, you know, directly out of calculus uh, and yet that's what works. Um, and a lot of people maybe thought of this idea and said, well, that's never gonna work. There's gonna be too many local minima. Um, in some sense, uh, there's, there's a lot of research now about like, the stochastic gradient descent process and why it's so uh, unreasonably successful. I think we understand that better, but nevertheless, that's the key idea. You need to have this kind of global function that's driving the learning. Um, and so the big mystery is, well, how does this actually work in the brain? Uh, this would be great if, if something like this could work in the brain, but you know these, these kind of error back propagation steps aren't really biological. And then what would you use um, you know, for training uh, these signals? Where, do, where does this hand of God come from, right? And those are basically the problems I've worked on in my research. I came up with this idea in grad school that you could actually use those same bi-directional connections to communicate error signals just by sort of rearranging the terms with back propagation. Um, and you end up with this learning rule. I won't go through any of the details here, but you end up with a learning rule that's local, but is actually computing the same thing as error back propagation and relying on those bi-directional weights, those top-down connections to essentially communicate the error signal. And the key thing here is that it uses the error signal as something that emerges over time. So you have uh, sort of a guess that takes place first, an expectation or a, a, you know, a prediction, if you will. And then later in time, you get kind of the right answer. And essentially the learning is just the difference between what was the state of activity in a very Hebbian way. This is a product of the sender and the receiver in this kind of outcome or plus phase minus that co-product in the minus phase, the guess phase. Um, this exact same learning rule also can be derived from the Boltzmann distribution and the Boltzmann machine uh, that was done by uh, Jeff Hinton in the 80s. And so this is basically a way of showing that you can use this same kind of learning rule and derive it directly from error back propagation. Um, so this is basically the idea I've been pursuing in my models uh, since that time. and uh, you can implement this idea using this BCM kind of framework by having essentially a floating threshold that represents this kind of term here, sorry, that you're subtracting essentially corresponds to a dynamic floating threshold that moves as a function of kind of the activity when you're making your guess relative to kind of the activity that's present um, during the outcome. And so in fact, this is a way to take, you know, the, the DCM idea and turn it into an error back propagation learning procedure. Um, and uh, it all kind of goes through. Um, and then just to sort of give you the rest of the story here, this kind of suggests a sort of prediction based idea. And so that's the idea that we've been working with more recently is trying to figure out how would the brain organize learning into these kind of temporal signals where you make a prediction and then you get kind of the right answer. And the idea is that you are constantly predicting what's gonna happen next. And then you're learning based on the difference between what happens and what, what, what you predicted. Um, and we think that there's these very nice circuits in the, in the biology between the thalamus and the cortex that basically separate those two signals. You get a kind of prediction coming top down from higher level areas. It's projected onto this particular part of your uh, thalamus called the pulvinar. Uh, 
And then that is sort of essentially compared with the outcome, what actually happens, which emerges through these, this other very distinctive feed forward driver pathway. And so there's a whole story about basically how the biology supports this prediction. And the idea is that essentially this pulvinar, this thalamus is essentially like a projection screen. You're sort of projecting your predictions onto the thalamus and it's receiving kind of this bottom up ground truth signal. And you're essentially oscillating your whole brain between this stage of prediction, outcome, prediction, outcome, prediction, outcome. So that's the kind of key idea for, for how learning might work. Uh, you know, uh, integrating these two uh, ideas about the synapses, learning in this way, and then this kind of overall network connectivity. And so, you know, there's a whole kind of story about how that emerges over time. We implemented it in another uh, model that actually captures a lot of that same hierarchy that we just went through before and showed that, in fact, uh, when, you, when you do this kind of uh, oscillating predicting learning, you get an emergence of high level representations that sort of capture these different categories according to shape. So there's no labels here. You don't, you don't tell the system what these objects are uh, in any labeled way, but it sort of by itself decided to group things in, by shape. So it uh, grouped the vertical things separate from the box-like things from the round, et cetera. So it sort of formed its own internal categories and, and the overall structure of what was learned sort of matches what it looks like in the brains of monkeys comparing V4 versus IT. And we also compared it, uh, what the model, how the model organized these objects compared to how the people sort of de novo organize those objects. Um, and so basically uh, putting all that together, this, this idea is that the bi-directional connectivity which is really good for, you know, kind of this attractor dynamics can also be good for error driven learning. Um, and that there are these circuits that allow the system to essentially do this sort of prediction over time. And uh, we can show that, that there is some degree of kind of emergence from that learning process of these abstract categories. Um, and actually we, we have a new experiment that we're running with a collaborator, Karen Zito at, at Davis, that actually seems to confirm that this model of how the synaptic learning is working does seem to actually hold in the brain, which is very exciting. So that's the that's the full story there. So thank you. And there's folks in my lab and funding, et cetera. Okay, thanks very much. That's uh, very nice. And uh, we're, we're over time, but we can have a few questions. I. Uh, can, I, I think I am completely out of the, this field. I don't understand anything, but I, I have very simple questions. Maybe, maybe some answers would be very interesting for me, at least, or I, I could read somewhere. When you are speaking of learning, uh, are you considering that the, that the brain when, of the child when it's formed is formed already in a, an ordered fashion, or does do you do, does one learn by modifying the synapses and by by doing is is that the learning is just uh, uh, how is circulate uh, you circulate currents or is that um, uh, a change of configuration of the synapses? So I, 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 wonder, I wonder which level you are considering. Is that, is that scheme already implanted in the, in the brain of the baby of one year old or even uh, one month old, I don't know? Or is, is the brain being transformed progressively, uh, 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 giving progressively order, uh, uh, an ordering of the synapses, which is going to to allow to allow this uh, the, uh, the functioning. So uh, yeah, exactly. So the idea is that this connectivity is is kind of present. Uh, this is what what you get kind of genetically. So mm -hmm. this this rough kind of hierarchical pattern of connectivity and all these different pathways. That's what unfolds kind of you know during you know the brain development in the womb, etc. 
So that's what you start with. That's the starting state is, you know, a network with it's broad patterns of connectivity. And it doesn't, it's not modified with, with, uh, with the learning. This is the point. And the then, then you have the learning on top of that, right? And that's changing the detailed synaptic strengths. Um, but it's also the case that there's sort of, uh, from you know uh, early development, there's a lot more synapses present yeah. than what you end up with, uh -huh. uh, and there's there's actually this very active process of pruning away all the synapses you didn't end up needing yeah. essentially. Yeah. Um, so it's very it's very it's just like a sculpting process, right? You start off with this more ill-formed blob of tissue and then you're essentially carving away all the parts you don't need and keeping the stuff you do need um, and shaping the detailed synapses. So there's both a synaptic story like basically changing the strength of the connections among the neurons. That's the primary engine of learning. So when we do our computational models of learning, that's all we do is we change the strength of connections among each neuron according to these learning rules. Um, but then at this larger level, there's kind of this process on top of that of essentially synaptic pruning that is trimming away all the synapses that you don't end up needing. And that kind of carves out this ultimate, you know, final structure. You see on the philosophy, in the philosophy, the situation is going to be very different. If you are, if you speak in terms of learning as a student learns, uh, when right. a student learns, is he modifying the synapses or is he? Yes. <laughs> it's well established that that's what it is ultimately ah. is modifying synapses. Ah, it's okay. Okay. That, then, I yeah. Guess. So you have the, yeah, genetics, absolutely. The, the genetics give you a starting uh, yes. pattern, and after you are modifying this pattern yep. by the way exactly. you are learning. Yep. Ah, okay, but that that, that yep, that, that's very very interesting. Yep, I, I didn't yep. think about it that, that, uh, before, but uh, it, yep. it, it tell it tells us that uh, that uh, that people are equal when uh, when they are born, or nearly equal when they are born, and can can uh, evolve in a way that uh, yes, they, they will become as intelligent. No, that, yep. that's uh, that, that's uh, <laughs> politics. Oh, we are entering politics at this level. <laughs> Randall, you didn't mention the, the contrast of short-term and long-term memory. How does that fit yeah. into this? Right, and so there, there's a very important um, uh, uh, differentiation between uh, the uh, both. There's there's two there's several aspects to that. Um, one is that the the synaptic changes themselves have a short-term and long-term component. So you can get short-term changes in the synapses that persist for about 15 minutes. And then if they're not further strengthened, uh, they, they kind of fade away. Um, and then there's also a, a kind of network level story uh, where in fact, right above this part of the network here, there's the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus seems to be particularly important for initially encoding new information. So um, as you're sort of, you know, uh, uh, encoding and, and listening and learning about something new, um, the synapses in the hippocampus are particularly important for forming those initial uh, kind of uh, traces of, of knowledge and then slowly the stuff that originally is learned in the hippocampus is sort of incorporated in the rest of your cortex. And so the, the, the kind of semantic long-term knowledge, like what is a dog? What, you know, what, what are these different concepts that we know about? Those are out in the cortex, but particular detailed facts, new things that you didn't know before, that initially is encoded in the hippocampus. And then uh, only kind of with more practice and over time, does it get sort of incorporated into the whole kind of semantic structure of your cortex? So there's there's lots of different dimensions to the learning process uh, over time as a function of these different kind of parts of the the network working together. But 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 then it's very, it's rather fun at this stage to compare the brain to to a computer. Uh, <clears throat> 
because in some sense you are telling us that you have a system which is loaded when you were born, which gives you the, the, the essence, the, well, the essence of, of uh, what could be a, a computer, in fact, uh, and the, the memories, you are organizing the memories by learning. Yep. And, you, and this is the big difference with the, the computers, which is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, if if you in the computers you you load Windows, and uh, everybody has the same, and so a, any computer is an absolutely analogous. The only thing that right. differs is what you put in the memories. Right. And in, in that sense, we have uh, we have a very similar situation, no? Uh, sort of, but you you do uh, you know you like the. The functionality. The difference, that it, the, the difference is that everybody is unique, while the computers are closed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, like in the computer, obviously, you can you can directly share a piece of software, and it works mm -hmm. identically across exactly systems. But in the brain, you have to learn. Each person has to learn their own their own set of synaptic connections. Exactly. And exactly. what's remarkable is that we end up, you know at all similar in our patterns of connectivity and, and functionality given but we are you know, how different. high dimensional it is. But we yeah. are all different in that sense. <laughs> it's time for lunch. Any more questions? One last question. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we will meet directly at two. Two. No, two uh, two. Yeah, very good. That's in an hour and a quarter's time. Okay. So thank you all the speakers this morning and all the discussion. It was great fun. And we'll see you all at two uh, uh, when uh, we will have uh, Eli's uh, talk on uh, on Saga computing. So see you back here at two okay. o'clock. So, so the computers are, are, are this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs>